thank you so much for joining our webinar today. This is going to be a webinar on fiber optics in 4K and 8K video distribution. And we really want you guys to be prepared for the future. We really want you guys to uh, be ready for these super high bandwidth signals. We've been dealing now with 18 gigs for a couple of years. And it's really delivering some awesome video and, and awesome audio for, for our customers and our clients. But, um, you know, we, we have to keep moving forward in this industry, of course. And some of the things that we're going to start to see in the future are things like not only 8K, but 10K. We're also dealing with higher frame rates and wider and wider color gamuts. And we really want you guys to, to be successful at this. And what we're finding right now is that we've got a limitation to how much bandwidth we can distribute over, over a copper-based infrastructure. So, you know, normal copper-based HDMI cables, copper-based category cables and things like that. Um, you know, we've got HDMI 2.1 right around the corner. We saw lots of it at CES. We had many, many TV manufacturers uh, touting that they're going to be HDMI 2.1 compliant this year. I uh, haven't really seen too many sources yet, but the, the TV manufacturers are, are getting a jump on it, it looks like. I thought for sure this would be something we would see more in 2021, but, uh, or, or 2020, um, you know, maybe a couple of years out. But uh, now here we are, 2019, and we will see it this year. So, you know, as things go in our industry, uh, just when we get really good at 18 gig, uh, you know, something else is thrown at us. And, you know, when we look at the specs and some of the numbers in today's presentation, um, you know, not only are we going to be exceeding 18 gigs, uh, but also 24. And then the HDMI 2.1 spec calls for up to 48 gigs of information. Um, so, you know, these very, very large screens that we're seeing at trade shows like CES, um, Augmented reality, we're seeing lots of demos on that now. Virtual reality is a huge thing these days. So, you know, as we progress in our industry, uh, we want you guys to be caught up. We want you guys to stay ahead of the game. Um, and really, for all these bandwidth requirements that we're dealing with right now, um, fiber is really going to be the way going forward. Uh, fiber has a lot of technical advantages over copper. Um, the, the price of fiber has come down quite a bit. You can terminate fiber in the field. Um, you know, it's no longer this weird, scary, expensive thing to do. So, you know, we're encouraging a lot of integrators right now to, um, you know, pre-wire homes with fiber, retrofit homes with fiber. Um, you know, I don't want to be in a situation where if I wire my house today with category cable, you know, five, 10, maybe two years from now, and all of a sudden I need, I need more bandwidth. So uh, even running fiber now and, and leaving it dark is a good idea. Uh, because we will need some of these uh, bandwidth requirements going forward. So that's what we're going to really talk about today. Um, for those of you who are new to AV Pro, welcome. Uh, for those of you who have attended our webinars before, uh, thanks for joining and returning. Uh, you may have heard my voice before. If not, my name is Jason. I am with AV Pro Edge. Uh, I've been with AV Pro Edge now for, for a couple of years. Um, I've been dabbling in audio video my entire life. I, I really love this stuff and I really geek out on it myself. I, I would definitely consider myself uh, an enthusiast. Um, got about 20 years now in the AV space. Uh, 16 of those years was uh, doing installation, and now I'm uh, now I'm doing some installation work, but mostly training and things like that. I've been doing ISF and currently practicing ISF now for about 11 years. Um, done a lot of work with HD Base T and those folks. So just a little bit about me, so you kind of get to know me. And um, you know, as we go through the presentation today, there is a question box. Um, feel free to answer any questions in the question box. Um, I'll do my best to answer those as we go along. If I can't answer your question as we're going along, uh, no big deal. We do have my partner in crime, Tom Devine. He is watching the question box and he's going to answer as many of those questions as possible. But if there are any questions you know, towards the end that we might not get to during the presentation, I'll go ahead and check, try to answer those questions for you. And if there's any questions that we uh, just don't have time to get to today, I will answer those individually. Uh, based on your email address, and we'll go ahead and post up the Q&A, um, all the questions and answers on the AV Pro Edge uh, uh, forums, and also we're going to record the session as well. So um, if you don't have a chance to catch the whole thing, then we're going to go ahead and um, post that up on our YouTube page uh, within the next day or so. So uh, feel free to keep your eyes peeled on our YouTube page, our Facebook page, Twitter, things like that, and, and we'll make sure to get a copy of this for you. Also, uh, we had a lot of requests during the morning session to get a copy of the presentation because there's some good technical stuff in there and some charts and some numbers that you might want. Uh, if you guys do want a copy of the presentation, we, we're, we're perfectly happy with sharing that with you. Uh, just let us know in the question box and uh, we'll get the presentation copy to you. 
Uh, a little bit about AV Pro Global. Again, if you're new to us, then welcome. We're we're really glad to have you. And if you're uh, if you've used us in the past, thank you so much for your continued support. Um, you know, we're we're a company who takes video quality, audio quality. Um, you know, we take this stuff very seriously. Uh, we've been doing 18 gig products since 2015. We got a giant jump on this. Um, you know, we, we make a full line of uh, HDMI matrix switches that are 18 gigs. HDMI extenders, distribution amplifiers. We have a whole line of HDMI cables. Uh, we try to provide you guys with tools um, to, to help you not only install this stuff, but also to troubleshoot it when things don't quite work out the way you expected it to. Um, we're very heavily involved with the ISF and video calibration, we, and we make that equipment for you as well, and, and we're happy to support you on that. Um, you know, the, the big thing with us is, um, you know, a lot of us come from an uh, installer and integrator background, and I remember as an installer working in the field that, you know, if I found a product that I really liked and it worked really well, I was super, super loyal to it. Um, that's all I like to use because it worked and I knew it. So, um, you know, that's that's where we want to be for you guys. So, you know, as we're going through the presentation, again, feel free to ask some questions. Um, if you have any questions about uh, anything super specific, again, my my email is jason at AV Pro Global, and then uh at the end of the presentation, too, we'll also give you uh, a little bit more information on how to get a hold of us and phone numbers and things like that. So today we're going to talk a lot about fiber and uh, really what the benefits are and what we're going to look forward to in the future and how to terminate it and the different types of fiber and things like that. Um, you know, one of the biggest technical advantages with fiber is it has the potential to carry much, much, much more, more bandwidth than what copper is capable of. Just to give you an example, uh, Bell Labs has been working on fiber for quite a while. And um, they have recently developed a fiber cable that is capable of passing one petabyte per second. So now we're talking you know, insane amounts of bandwidth. And I know that sounds like a lot, and it, it surely is, especially compared to today's signals being 18 and, and soon to be 48 gigs. We're talking a petabyte. But you know, if you think about um, the long, you know, think about it in a long term, think about it, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the future, uh, down the road, then, you know, this is the kind of stuff that we might be interested in. You know, we've got, uh, I mentioned before, like with augmented reality and virtual reality, you know, we may need that much bandwidth in the future. In fact, we probably will. Um, you know, as things keep increasing, you know, we, 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 we all know about Moore's law and every 18 months things double and stuff like that. But, you know, just thinking back to uh, when I bought my first computer, uh, for me, it was in high school. So I'm probably dating myself now, but um, I remember having a 19 gig hard drive thinking, wow, there's no way where I'm ever going to use this whole thing. And, you know, now I've got, you know, way more than that on a smartphone. So as we, um, as we joke about things like that and, you know, the old IBM, you know, picture, the guy's pushing a refrigerator sized hard drive into a building and it's like three megabytes, you know, um, that, uh, we have to lay the foundation today for, for what we're going to deal with in the future. Now that doesn't mean that you or I, or, or anybody in our generation is going to ever maybe see one petabyte, but you never know, you know, we might, we might be dealing with some really freaky stuff here in the next 20, 30 years, maybe, but, um, the foundation is being laid today. Um, you know, and one of the great things about fiber is especially in a, in an audio video environment, like what we deal with every day, if we can future, uh, not necessarily future proof, I, I don't like that word, but if we can make a home future resistant, meaning if we go ahead and run fiber now, even if you don't, uh, necessarily hook anything up to it, you could leave it dark. Because I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to rewire a home every five to ten years. So let's go ahead and get the fiber ran now. In some cases, you you might be using it right now, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit today. But we're definitely going to be using it in the future. So I do want to cover some of the things that make fiber great um, and what the technical advantages is uh, the technical advantages are over copper. Um, and again, like I mentioned before, how to terminate it, what tools are needed, uh, what to look for when you're shopping for fiber. Um, we do have a, a, a nice variety of products. Uh, you know, our bullet train cables, our, um, our AV Pro Edge extenders. We do have a lot of products right now that are supporting fiber. So uh, let's go ahead and lay the foundation now. That way the future is much easier for all of us. So let's start off with why fiber? Why, why even use fiber to begin with? So one of the biggest benefits of fiber is that we have a truly uncompressed um, signal traveling from point A to point B. Um, we know right now we're dealing with 18 gigabits per second in HDMI 2.0. We're going to be dealing with 48 gigs in HDMI 2.1. Um, you know, when we are running category cables as our extenders, um, you know, it, it does top out at uh, 
about 10.2 gigs. And you know, there's some tricks that we figured out over the years, and there's some things that we've done to um, kind of hide the fact that it's compressed, so it still looks good on the other end. But you know, if you have a very demanding environment or a video type, uh, video file type of client, uh, somebody who's super picky about the picture and they just want the best, then you know, Fiber is a great solution because we're we're truly uncompressed at this point. Another thing that's great about Fiber is the distance that you can run it. Um, so, for example, if you're going to extend an HDMI signal. Uh, from one room to another, um, you know, you can do that today with copper and it's no big deal. But if you talk ultra long distances, um, we, you know, we have fiber products that support up to two kilometers. So if you're wiring up the high school football stadium or, um, you know, some very, very large, you know, maybe library or government building, or maybe you just have a really big home, maybe, maybe you're working on a, you know, 25,000 square foot mansion, you know, whatever the case is. Um, these fiber products are going to be able to get uh, uncompressed signals from point A to point B. Um, again, the, the bandwidth on, on this stuff is, is just immense, and that's what we need right now. Fiber also transmits signals a lot faster. Uh, we are hearing some reports back from people who are really in the video games about input lags and stuff like that being improved. Um, you know, one great thing about copper, or about fiber rather, is um, with, if you take a copper-based cable, maybe it's HDMI, category, whatever the case is, if you run that cable next to an AC handler or maybe you run it above a kitchen where there's a lot of, you know, uh, electric motors doing things like, you know, blenders and microwaves and refrigerators and dishwashers and garbage disposals and things like that. All of those things create electromagnetic interference and um, that stuff can really interfere, interfere with copper based cables and you have problems with. Uh, signal dropouts or no signal at all or lots of uh, noise in the picture and things like that. Well, because of the way fiber works, and we'll get a little deeper into how it works in a few slides here, but because of the way fiber works is the whole problem with electromagnetic interference is completely thrown out the window. Um, something that I have a lot of personal experience with, especially being based in Florida, is, uh, you know, sometimes there's a thunderstorm and, you know, the neighbor's house gets hit by a power surge that somehow makes it makes its way into your house. So you've lost a couple of components. And usually that is because the power surge somehow made its way um, through the home and into an HDMI cable and then eventually to a TV. And now we've got a, a bricked TV because of a power surge. With fiber, there are no ways for power to, to um, travel over that fiber cable. So things like electromagnetic interference and power surges and, and uh, those kind of nasty things, we don't have to worry about with fiber at all. We've, we have plenty of instances where uh, integrators have ran fiber cable right next to Romex and right next to air conditioner handlers and whatnot, and um, you know generators and things like that, and, and with no problems at all, which is very very good for an installer. Um, the fiber cable itself is is much more reliable and, and more resilient than copper. You know, copper will do things like oxidize if it's exposed to uh, exposed to the elements. We don't have to worry about that all uh, at all with fiber. Uh, and again, uh, I like to use the term future resistant uh, because future proofing is impossible. I mean, none of us have a crystal ball. None of us can tell the future, but we want to make it as simple as, uh, as possible for you to upgrade stuff later. So being able to have these uh, high bandwidth, no interference type of cables um, is really going to help us going forward in the future. And it's really going to help advance the industry. And, you know, when, when um, eventually one of these days when we have a 8K, 120 frames per second, micro LED wall that's taking up the size of a wall in a home, um, you know, these are the kind of products that we need to, to, to be able to deliver that super awesome experience. If anybody had a chance to see the crystal, the Sony crystal LED wall or the Samsung micro LED wall at CES knows what I'm talking about. I mean, this stuff is really, really cool. It's going to be very affordable soon. And, um, you know, in situations in, you know, sports arenas and sports bars and even homes where somebody wants a massive TV, then this is going to be the way to go. So the fiber is really going to help us make it make it to that next step. So let's talk a little bit about some basics around fiber. These are just some very, you know, 10,000 level view um, fundamental type things that if you're dealing with fiber, this is all stuff that you kind of need to know going forward and to build your infrastructure. Um, right off the bat, I do want to mention that um, our fiber products, we've partnered with a company called Clearline, who's really, really doing great work in this space. Um, we've partnered up with them, and they've, they've really helped get the ball rolling on, on, on using fiber in our industry. Um, there's two types of fiber that you're typically, typically going to see out there. You'll see optical multi-mode, and you'll see optical single mode. Optical multi-mode is what we're going to use in most situations for AV. 
There could be some situations where you want optical single mode, and that would be if you were wiring, um, if you were wiring, let's say, a city, and you needed uh, miles and miles and miles of fiber optic cable, you're going to do optical single mode. But for uh, you know, if you start doing your measurements in kilometers or feet, then optical multi mode is going to be uh, great for most cases. Uh, we'll look at some specific numbers later, and we'll see exactly how far these um, uh, these types of cables, the different types of cables, can carry the signal. Fiber is graded in different ratings, so you'll see OM1 all the way up to OM5. Uh, typically, right now, the two extremes are, are not really being used too much in our space. Uh, the way you kind of decipher the OM1, OM2, um, et cetera, et cetera, is OM is for optical multimode, and then the number after that is uh, kind of represents the, the clarity or, or uh, how clear the, the actual glass itself is. So um, OM5, for example, is going to be much uh, clearer and much more pure than, say, OM1. Uh, we don't really see too much OM1 anymore. We're pretty much right now living in an OM2, OM3, OM4 space. OM5 can be a little overkill for a residential or, or even a commercial application unless you're in one of those situations where you're wiring up a... Um, you know, a, a small village or, or or some kind of requirement that you would need to go miles and miles. But uh, again, so for what we're going to be doing in, in most applications, we're going to be talking about OM2, OM3, OM4. Um, and OM3 is really a very, very common, um, a common grade to go with right now. Um, there are several types of connectors out there for, um, for fiber, but we're primarily going to be working with LC types of connectors and SC type of connectors. Uh, those are both available uh, through ClearLine. They're both available on our website. There are some more, but we're going to be primarily using those two in the AV space. They're really easy to tell apart. Um, the SC connectors, uh, the ends are more squared, and they're much bigger. If you were to look at the LC versus the SC connector, the SC is easy to point out because it's, uh, it's much bigger. Uh, we're going to look at some different types of fiber as far as the cable construction goes. Uh, we've got a couple slides on that for you coming up here. So we're going to look at some things like simplex versus duplex versus um, micro distribution. There's there's a handful of them that I'll cover for you. Uh, another thing that I want to point out here, that very last bullet point. If you've used fiber in the past, a lot of us have at this point. We're, we've been using it now for a little while. It's still pretty new. But if you've used it in the past, are you terminating it yourself or are you buying it pre-terminated? This throws a lot of people through a loop, especially if they're brand, brand new to all of this. Um, it's always been this sort of... Um, it's always been very difficult to terminate fiber because of, um, you know, just the way the fiber cable has been constructed in the past, the tools that were required. Um, a lot of times you would need a special uh, license to do it or a special uh, certification. The tools were crazy expensive. Um, I remember seeing guys working on fiber in my neighborhood many, many, many years ago. And, you know, they're underneath like a tent and it's, um, you know, the, the, the big worry is that those, those fiber particles, um, you know, even just a tiny piece of it, if it gets stuck in your skin or if it gets, you know, God forbid, it gets ends up in your body somehow, it can it can wreak havoc. But those days are over, which is nice. Uh, you can easily terminate fiber now in about a minute with uh, with the right tools. Um, so we'll cover that some of that stuff. It, it's much safer than it used to be. Uh, it's a lot easier than it used to be and a lot less expensive than it used to be. Uh, we do have a couple of solutions that we'll go over uh, towards the end of the PowerPoint. If um, if you are interested in in um, having us terminate your fiber for you, um, especially on big projects where you might be doing you know hundreds perhaps of fiber terminations, uh, we've got a package and, and some plans for you guys to to um, save you some time in the field. We've traditionally used copper cable to distribute um, audio and video signals. This has been since pretty much the beginning of electricity. Um, copper has always been used because of its cost and because of how conductive it is. Um, it, we've seen it for years and years and years. I mean, of course, there's other materials out there that uh, conduct better, like silver, but then the price goes way, way, way up, as you may have seen um, previously in some, you know, audio file slash video file grade HDMI cables, for example. Um, so it's all about like cost and how far it can go and things like that. And, you know, for the longest time, fiber, um, it could always go the distance, but the cost was always an issue. And uh, But nowadays, um, it's very, very affordable, and and uh, the distances are just so much more than, than copper can ever handle. Um, you know, the cool thing about fiber, a couple things we mentioned before already, uh, there's no need to compress the signal, so the picture is as pure as possible. 
um, much, much longer distances, no power surges to worry about, no electromagnetic interference to worry about. So there's several advantages of using the, uh, the fiber as your infrastructure versus copper. Let's look at a couple numbers really quick. Um, this is the sort of stuff that really kind of proves the point about how, um, how much bandwidth is going to be required in the future. Uh, this chart that you're seeing on the page right now is easily um, available to you if you'd like it. It's on our website. Um, if you'd like a copy of it, um, again, feel free to send us a message and we're, we're happy to share. But it is on our website. But I do want to point out a couple of things here for you. If we go all the way the back, all the way to the back and to the beginning of HDMI, we don't have the earliest, earliest versions on here. But if we start with 1.4, that's when things started to get a little more serious in our world as far as bandwidth goes. Uh, we were able to do, you know, 3D. By this point, we're able to do uncompressed um, audio formats at this point, or at least you know, at least high res, sometimes uncompressed audio formats. Um, and HDMI 1.4 did us great for a very, very long time. But as we progress through the years and uh, movies are being mastered with higher dynamic range and wider color gamuts and higher resolutions, then our bandwidth requirements just shoot up like crazy. So I wanna share a, a perfect example of this with you. There's a Blu-ray movie out there called Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk. Um, it was directed by Ang Lee. It came out a few years ago. Um, it was shot at 120 frames per second. But because that was so far outside of the bandwidth uh, requirements for a Blu-ray disc, um, they did knock it down to 60 frames per second. But what's, I, what's uh, interesting about that is it's the only Blu-ray disc that, uh, that exists that I know of, and feel free to chime in if you know of any others, but it's the only one that I know of that was done at 60 frames per second on the disc. And we do see that sometimes in video games, but we're talking a Hollywood movie. So let's take a look at some numbers and what is required as far as bandwidth goes for that movie to, to look right. So it's 3840 by 2160, of course, so that's 4K. It's 60 frames per second on the disc. Of course, we want 444 color if we can have it. That's, that's something that we strive for. Um, now, you'll notice here that the color depth is only 8 bits. There's also HDR. Of course, it's HDMI 2.0. Now, with all of these different um, specs kind of added up, if we're talking about bandwidth, we're at 17.82 gigs. Remember, guys, HDMI 2.0 tops out at 18 gigs. So if I were to if I were to do – if we were to set that movie up to where it was 10-bit instead of 8, keeping everything else preserved – we're now exceeding the 18 gig uh, bandwidth requirement, and now we're looking at something like 22 gigs. So we're really not going to see a movie like that in its full glory until we have um, HDMI 2.1. And we're really not going to see it, uh, it, it with, with that much bandwidth until we have something um, much more robust as infrastructure like fiber. So you, know, you could easily stay under 18 gigs if you change the frame rate to you know, 30 or 24, but the movie was made to be 60 frames per second on a disc. So it has a very unique look to it. So why not, you know, why not watch it like that? That's how it was made. So the the point here is that, you know, something has to give when we're talking 18 gigs. If we get into 24 and 48 gigs, we have a lot more bandwidth to work with and we don't have to kind of pick and choose um, how to watch a movie. Everything everything will be there. And then eventually, you know, years, years out from now, we, we might be talking about, um, as high as 100, and I believe the, the next spec after 48, I think the number we're aiming for is 176 or 178. So, you know, now we're talking um, 10K, 120, maybe even higher, super wide color gamuts. You know, by that time, we probably will have TVs that are doing Rec 2020 and things like that. So, again, this is just to show you the progression. We started off just under a gig. Now we're at 18, and going forward, we're going to have more and more and more. Okay. So, something that we have to cover. Uh, right off the bat is picture quality. Um, it's very easy to look at a TV and say, yeah, that looks good. But what looks good about it? So, um, you know, again, we work very, very close with the ISF. Um, you know, the the studying, the research has already been done. They've studied for years and years and years, like what makes a picture actually look good? And it's really based off these four things that you see on the screen right now. These four things are what they are uh, just because this is the way our eyes work. This is the way that our, our brains work. Um, so. If we look at picture quality number one, it's dynamic range. Also happens to be audio quality number one. Um, you know, we're constantly chasing dynamic range. Uh, there's there's a there's a very very important reason why the uh, OLED TVs are doing so well right now because of the dynamic range. I mean, you take one look at it and and you can tell like you know the blacks are are perfect black and 
they have very, very good contrast ratios, and that's the kind of thing that our eyes really, really like and our brains really like. So, you know, watching, um, you know, watching an OLED with with perfect blacks and a nice dark room and a movie that is done with high dynamic range. I mean, there's there's just nothing like it. Nothing can beat it right now. After dynamic range, then we look at color saturation. Number two, color saturation very simply um, is how much color is in the picture. Uh, if there's not enough color, things look kind of washed out. If there's too much color, things can look a little um, cartoonish and skin tones look like they're sunburned and things like that. But we've got a slide here coming up that'll show you the differences between the color we're looking at right now in HD and the color that we're going to be looking forward to in the future and even some of the stuff that we're looking at right now in, in UHD. Number three on the list is better color. Better color kind of refers to a couple of things. Um, we want more accuracy in our colors. Uh, if you look at a specific sports team or if you look at a specific logo of a company you might be familiar with, you know, we want that to be as accurate as possible. Something else that we're worried about too are artifacts in color. So if you take a movie like um, Mad Max, for example, where uh, in that movie is very orange, the sky is very orange, um, there's a lot of orange going on in that in that movie. And you'll see this in a lot of movies where there's bold colors in the background, especially solid bold colors. If you've ever seen banding before, it's very easy to spot. Instead of the sky going from like a light orange to a more saturated orange smoothly in that movie, sometimes you'll see almost like stripes in the orange sky. And that's referred to as banding. I've got a screenshot coming up here. I'll show you an example of what I mean. One of the great things about, um, about uh, you know, HDMI 2.1 and going forward, we're going to have higher bit depths. So we're going to be able to deliver a smoother picture, uh, especially looking at, at the, the sky in a movie like that or a blue sky in Planet Earth or movies like The Martian. I mean, there's plenty of them out there where, where you can find this kind of stuff. And then last but not least is resolution. How clear is the picture? How big can it, how big can we make the picture? How close can I sit? You know, if I want to be fully immersed um, by the screen, you know, some people like to sit in the front row at the movie theater. That's cool. And if the resolution's high enough, it still looks good. You still can't see pixels, and it's still a, a nice, smooth picture for you. All these things that we're talking about right now, if we want more and more and better and better, like we tend to do in our industry, um, we have to be able to deliver the bandwidth to achieve this stuff. And copper, in a lot of cases, it's just going to – we're going to hit a wall where copper's not going to be able to deliver this stuff, and that's that's why we want to talk about fiber so much. A little bit about HDR. Um, one of the interesting things about HDR is we're finally starting to see content, whether it's a TV show or a movie, we're finally starting to see it closer to what the director intended and, and how the images were captured. Um, in standard dynamic range, things have to be squished so much and compressed so much to be able to fit, um, you know, to be able to fit it on a Blu-ray disc or to, to be able to broadcast it, to be able to stream it and those types of things. So the signals have to be super compressed, and that hurts the dynamic range. It hurts the color. Um, we're finally starting to open this stuff up and, and really see more closely to what was intended at the at the beginning of it all. If you take a movie like Blade Runner 2049, um, we're watching it right now in slightly of a smaller color space than what it was actually mastered in. So um, you know, one of the things that's going to be really cool about all this going forward is when we finally have these super high bandwidth um, systems and and we and we have TVs that can reproduce these colors and projectors that can reproduce these colors. Um, you know, a lot of us are going to be going back and watching our movies, uh, you know, a few years from now, and we're going to see some stuff that we never saw before. So it's going to be really, really cool to see um, to see our older movies and to see uh, how, how great they actually look once we're seeing them uh, closer to their proper format. Uh, a little bit about color. Um, what you see on the left side of the screen is, this is called a CIE chart. This represents human vision. This is everything that we can see. The triangles inside are the different color gamuts that we've worked with uh, in the past and what we're going to see in the future. So, for example, we take this nice, big, wide color space. That's everything that we can see. Um, if we look at this Rec 709 dotted line right here, that's the color space that we've all been looking at since the late 1990s up until today with regular high definition and with Blu-ray. Um, it's a nice, big color space. It's much bigger than standard definition, which was... It was called Rec 601. It was right around here somewhere. But if you look at these other triangles, these are the things that we're trying to, to work towards. Eventually, at the end of the day, our end goal, for this format at least, is going to be Rec 2020. And you see this nice big color triangle. Um, there's some colors that we're going to finally see on TV that we've never seen before. For example, for example, Coca-Cola Red is way out here somewhere. We've never seen that on TV properly. 
I was watching Blue Planet 2 recently. There were some researchers on a research vessel out in the middle of the ocean, and they were all wearing the safety lime green um, vest like you see on a construction site, and it's way out here somewhere. And I remember seeing that uh, – I was watching that show, and you know, one of the things that really took me for surprise was – you know, wow, the safety vest yellow on their on their um, vest actually looks more like real life. It was pretty cool. It, it looked, you know, compared to standard dynamic range and, and 709 color, it looks very kind of muted and almost a little washed out. But, you know, it has this nice bright pop to it um, with, in, in a bigger color space. Um, what we're dealing with right now, like I said before, Rec 2020 is our end goal. But we're seeing right now, just because of physical limitations to displays at this point, we don't have any displays right now that are quite hitting that Rec 2020. But we're going to get there eventually. But what we're dealing with right now is this P3 color space. It's the dash lines right here. It's bigger than 709, not quite as big as 2020. But if you look at the difference between the different color gamuts, you know, as we get bigger and bigger and bigger, we gain a lot through our greens and blues and cyan colors and our yellows and our oranges. Um, you know, we, we're very sensitive to these high frequency colors, especially green. So as we get more and more and more with our color saturation, you know, if you watch a movie uh, with a forest scene or uh, a nature documentary with a jungle or grasslands or something, we're going to start to finally see these nice, deep, saturated greens. And uh, I mentioned before, like the safety vest yellow, but you have different tones in here for sunsets. And the only way to achieve these nice, big, wide color gamuts is bandwidth. And we, we really need the bandwidth. So um, again, this is just another reason why fiber is going to really carry us into the future. Here's a couple of just real world examples of what we mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, this is a comparison of P3 color space versus Rec 2020. And you'll notice this shot here of a, what looks like a produce department at the grocery store. There's a bunch of greens in here that we're not getting in P3. Uh, if you look at this flower, there's some yellows out here. We don't see this flamingo. I'm sorry, this, uh, oh yeah, the flamingo. There's some pinks and reds out here we're missing. There's some greens and purples we're missing on this flower. There's some stuff out here we're missing. These little uh, little sheds or houses, there's a bunch of blues and stuff we're missing out on. So to see this stuff more like real life, we're going to need the bandwidth and we're going to need the infrastructure to do it. Just a few examples here, but there's a, a zillion of them out there. I mentioned before about bit depths and color banding. Um, this is kind of what I was describing in a movie like The Martian. Uh, I've also seen it in Planet Earth 2 during the Cities episode. If you play it at the very beginning, there's some monkeys that are jumping like from building to building. It's a shot. Uh, the camera is shooting up at them, so there's a bright blue sky in the background. Um, and even at 10 bits, there's a little bit of banding artifacts there. But at 8 bits, it, what we're dealing with right now for, for most cases, you have a lot of banding. 10 bit, it gets much smoother. 12 bit, 12 bit it gets even smoother than that. So here's where we want to be eventually by the by the end of it all. And we're seeing some movies right now that are definitely 10, uh, 10 bit and, and higher. So the higher we get in bit depth, the more bandwidth is required, but we're going to get these nice smooth transitions. And again, the whole end goal here is we're working our way towards uh, an image that's artifact free and looks more like real life, but we just need the bandwidth to do it. Okay, last but not least, when we judge picture quality is resolution. Uh, this, the overall sharpness, the overall clarity of the image. Um, Resolution is really kind of the final piece of the puzzle. Once you have all the pixels looking good, meaning good dynamic range, good color, uh, then we start to worry about the amount of pixels. So, you know, don't let resolution trick you. Uh, don't, you know, it's not the most important thing. It is very important, but, you know, don't let that be your end all be all for determining picture quality. It's not just about the number of pixels. It's about how good those pixels are too. But like I said before, you know, with, with higher and higher resolutions, um, I'll give you a perfect real world example of of what I'm dealing with um, personally. So um, I just made the upgrade from uh, plasma to OLED in the living room, same size TV, but now I'm dealing with 4K instead of 1080p. That allowed me to move my seat a little bit closer. Um, I'm much closer than I was before. I can't see any pixels. I'm much more immersed by the picture. Um, and it just it's really cool to see a movie like that. So being able to be fully immersed, get these giant screen sizes, being able to sit closer. This is where resolution really comes into play. So, you know, when we look at these giant wall size video screens, uh, like we saw at CES, that's when the really high resolution stuff uh, becomes really important. If we're talking a 32 inch TV and somebody's sitting 10 feet from it, it, it it's a little overkill. I, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to dance around that, but um, you know, we start talking, you know, 65 inch right now is a good example. 
it's like a very common size now. 50 used to be big, now 50 is small. So as we go bigger and the, and the standards uh, get require more bandwidth and the screens get bigger and bigger screens become the norm, uh, the high-res stuff is going to be really important. Also, I mentioned before too, uh, with augmented reality and virtual reality, when you especially virtual reality, when you have a screen three inches from your face under a helmet or something like that, then the high resolutions, the low pixel densities, or rather high pixel densities, rather, um, you know, that stuff really starts to make a difference. Again, to achieve this stuff, we need the bandwidth, and fiber is going to be able to provide that for us. So here's a few numbers and kind of some dates to, um, you know, the dates of when this stuff is, stuff is supposed to happen. Um, HDMI 1.4, that's been around for a while. We've, we've been dealing with that for quite a while. That's um, That gets us about 9 gigs worth of bandwidth. Um, 2013, we saw the introduction of HDMI 2.0. That's what allowed us to do things like 4K, HDR, all the stuff we're dealing with today. Uh, going forward, November of 2017, um, it's already been a little over a year now, uh, or two years now rather, where uh, we're dealing with uh, HDMI 2.0. Um, and I'm sorry, HDMI 2.1, that's going to get us 24 gigs. We're, we will see some content at 24 gigs, and then we will see some stuff uh, wide open at the full 48 gigs. That's going to give us uh, up to 12 bits of, of bit depth, so nice smooth gradations and colors. Um, of course, all the HDR stuff, the wider color gamuts, 120 frames per second, uncompressed color. So we're kind of chasing, uh, we're chasing the bandwidth, and we're finally starting to get caught up now. So I mentioned before that copper has been used for forever for um, for uh, AV distribution and for our cabling and speaker wires and power cables and everything that we've used before has primarily been copper based. Um, but again, there's some downfalls to copper. There's some there's some technical limitations to it. It's heavy. Um, and we really want to get into um, we really want to get you guys into a situation where the the fiber is kind of your go to. Um, you know, if I were wiring a home right now. Um, I, I would definitely would would run it with fiber. I probably would though uh, consider also running some category cable because maybe I want to hardwire, say, a network. You know, so if you're pre-wiring a home now or you're retrofitting a house now, um, and you are planning on going with category cable for your infrastructure, go ahead and throw a piece of fiber in there too. It's it's not very expensive. It's not gonna certainly not gonna hurt anything. It doesn't take up much space at all. Um, but you're gonna have it there in the future when when that home is gonna require it. So a little bit about how fiber works. Um, it's very, very cool, and it still is very um, interesting to me, and, and I'm fascinated by it because the technology seems almost sci-fi. It's, it's really, really cool stuff. So if you picture a piece of glass, um, it's, it's about the size of a human hair. Uh, it's teeny, tiny, teeny, tiny little stuff. Um, what's interesting about it, what makes it work the way it does, instead of electrons, flowing down a piece of copper like we've used traditionally. This is light passing through a piece of glass. Um, instead of the electrons, we're dealing with photons. Um, there's pulses of light that flash through the fiber optic cable. Those pulses of light are what represents the ones and the zeros. This stuff can fly. It's super, super, super fast. Like I mentioned before, Bell Labs is has developed a one petabyte per second fiber cable. Uh, fiber is what we're using for our um, for, for the internet infrastructure from continent to continent. Um, it's what's being laid in, in most new construction situations right now. Um, there's plenty of neighborhoods uh, around my area and, and many, many, many others where fiber is becoming the infrastructure. Um, this is the way to go in the future, and, and we're seeing it in the real world now, very common. The light source for the pulses of light that are traveling down the, the fiber optic cable, uh, typically laser or LEDs. It just depends on the manufacturer, how far things have to go. Um, laser does a very good job at this, but for some shorter distances and things like that, LEDs work as well. Um, here's a just a quick um, uh, kind of exploded view of the fiber cable itself. So on the outside of the cable, you have the jacket, the protective jacket. Um, you know, we see that on all kinds of cables. Uh, fiber is no different. Uh, this is going to protect the cable and all the in uh, all the guts um, of the cable itself. Uh, Next layer are the strengthening fibers. In the clear line stuff, uh, they use Kevlar, which is super, super, super strong. Um, what I like about that is because they put Kevlar in there, if you have to pull the cable and um, you're having a hard time with it, you're gonna wanna pull the Kevlar. Uh, the stuff is very strong, you're not gonna break it. You can pull the Kevlar as hard as you want. Um, I forget the exact number, but um, it's something like 10,000 times the strength of, of 
copper. So, um, or I'm sorry, of, of plastic. So if you are going to pull on a cable and, and run it, then the Kevlar really helps a lot. The next layer is the cladding. Um, that protects the core. Um, it also helps the light pass through the cable. Um, after that is the, I'm sorry, there's the coating, and then after that's the cladding, and then after that is the core. So you can see the difference in comparison of the core versus the jacket. This is teeny tiny little stuff here. Um, the nice thing is, is the termination tools and the, and the wire strippers that come with the kit that we offer. Um, it has everything that you need to be able to strip this back and terminate it properly. But I wanted you guys to see kind of what was going on underneath the hood here um, on, the, on the construction of the cable itself. Okay, let's talk about some different types of cable constructions with fiber. Uh, what we're going to cover today are uh, some of the more common things that, that we'll see in, in the world of AV. Uh, that includes the simplex cables, the duplex cables. Uh, there are some spe uh, specialty cables for distribution and micro distribution. Um, so we'll take a look at each one of those and kind of explain each one. So this is simplex cable. It's a single strand of fiber under a single jacket. This is a very common situation and it's just like what we looked at kind of right here. This is a simplex cable construction. Um, one thing I do wanna mention is uh, regardless of what type of cable construction that you desire for your situation, um, everything that we offer is available in different types of jackets. Maybe you, maybe you need plenum rated cable for a commercial environment. Uh, you know, We can certainly get that going for you. Uh, there's riser ratings, there's everything that you would need to get this job done and, and any kind of jacket style that you need we can certainly provide that for you there's also a duplex cable this is a single strand of fiber in its own jacket but it's much like traditional speaker wire where it's kind of molded together right here in the middle uh, good for patch cables good for jumpers things like that uh, if you do need to separate them just like speaker wire you can kind of pull them apart uh, but this is a great solution if you're wiring a home um, you know, the, the simplex cable is a good solution too, but if you run duplex in a home right now or a commercial environment, um, you know, that gives you kind of some redundancy, which I'm a huge fan of. You know, if one of these fiber lines ends up one day uh, getting, you know, crushed or, or it's just something really weird happens to it and it fails, you've got a backup. Or you, um, you know, now you have the potential to run two pieces of fiber uh, or two fiber signals to that room. Duplex is a very, very common solution right now for, for pre-wires. There's also something called a breakout cable. Uh, you also sometimes hear this called as a fan out cable. Uh, there's multiple pieces of fiber uh, with multiple jackets. So like in this case, uh, if you look at this diagram, there's uh, four in here. So there's four individual pieces of fiber in their own jacket, but it's all ran as one cable. So if you need to get you know 30 pieces of fiber, for example, to a rack or something like that, then you might want to consider a breakout cable. Uh, this again, and, and like the others, like I mentioned before, uh, these are different, uh, available in different types of uh, jackets as well. Then you have something called micro distribution. This is typically a little bit smaller, a bit lighter, uh, and a little less costly than what we looked at before in the breakout cable. Um, a little bit smaller diameter. Um, this is multiple strands of fiber in the same jacket. Uh, this works in a lot of situations too, where you might need, um, you know, potentially maybe you need dozens of pieces of fiber. Uh, for your project, uh, micro distribution is a good way to go as well. Okay, so what do you need to build this super robust, awesome fiber infrastructure? Um, it's really quite simple. It's not that much different than what we've done in the past, wiring um, wiring a distribution system with copper. Uh, the biggest difference is, of course, obviously you're going to run fiber cable um, along with or instead of the copper cable. Um, you're going to be able to terminate the ends yourself in the field. Um, you're not going to necessarily always have to go with some pre-terminated cables. Uh, we will offer that for you, and there is some stuff out there that's available. Don't get me wrong, but um, you know what's nice is you can buy a 500 or 1,000 foot spool of fiber and terminate it yourself and, and use it as as needed. Um, the fiber extender, uh, I'm sorry, the fiber um, termination end here, uh, that's going to just plug straight into your um, fiber product. So this is an example of one of our fiber extenders. So the um, the end here looks like an LCN, gets terminated onto the OM3 fiber cable, and then that plugs into the uh, fiber extender. On the other side of this, if we were to flip it around, you have your HDMI connection. So this particular piece right here is changing the HDMI signal over to fiber, and then on the receiver end, it does just the opposite. Um, what you'll also see in a lot of fiber products is something called an SPF. It's a, it's, it stands for a small form factor plug, and that's this little guy right here. 
this is the piece that's responsible for turning the electrons into light or vice versa, depending on if you're talking about the transmitter or receiver. Uh, these FPFs right here, in a lot of cases, you'll have some products where um, the SPF is modular, uh, meaning you can pull it out and you can put a new one in. So what's nice about this is if you're dealing with a, let's say for example, a 10 gig SPF in an extender, and later you wanna upgrade that to 100 gigs, then instead of buying a brand new kit with brand new pieces of hardware, you can pull out the 10 gig SPF, you can pop in the 100 gig SPF, and now you're good to go for 100 gigs. So some of this stuff can be made modular and made to be upgraded, um, but that's just kind of like a really uh, really high level view on, on what you would do. Again, it's not that much different than building infrastructure out of copper. The installation and the kits and that kind of thing is very, very similar. There's not really a whole heck of a lot new to learn here. Um, on this end, you're gonna have your source or your rack or whatever's outputting. That's gonna be HDMI into your transmitter. Um, the transmitter is going to be connected to a receiver via fiber. Again, you can go up to two, uh, two kilometers right now. Um, the receiver is going to bring in the fiber, kind of come out HDMI, and then it's going to connect to the TV uh, like we've always done it in a traditional sense. So nothing terribly new here, um, which hopefully gives you guys a little bit of peace of mind um, and, and helps you realize how, how easy this stuff actually is. So let's talk about terminating a little bit. Um, terminating fiber is nowhere near as hard as it used to be, nowhere near as expensive, and it's certainly certainly not dangerous anymore. Uh, the clear line fiber specifically um, has some protective coatings in it to where um, even if you um, even if you poked your finger with the fiber itself, uh, it's not going to get stuck in your skin. It's not going to hurt you. It's not going to get into your bloodstream. Um, it's not going to you know if you rub your eyes or something, it's not going to get stuck in there. This is very very safe stuff to use. Um, if you get yourself, uh, give yourself some practice and, and you do it a lot in, in repetition, uh, you can easily terminate fiber in a minute or less. I've done it a handful of times. I'm getting pretty good at it now. Um, sometimes when we're doing live classes, we'll, we'll even do like, you know, make it fun and have some, have some races and things like that. But, um, you know, it's super easy to terminate and we're going to look at the steps on how to terminate it here coming up pretty soon. Um, and again, I, I know I mentioned this a lot, but this is a big thing that scares people is, is, uh, getting those glass particles stuck in your skin and whatnot, but no worries with the clear line stuff especially. Okay, so this is an example, excuse me, this is an example of a, of a kit that we sell at AV Pro. Um, this kit's gonna have everything you need in it to start terminating fiber right off the bat. The first thing that we're gonna talk about are the Kevlar shears. Remember, inside of the fiber itself is Kevlar, so we have to have something very, this is the Kevlar right here, we have to have something very, very sharp um, to be able to cut that Kevlar. Um, so we're going to get a set of Kevlar shears. Now I'll give you a, just a quick little tip. Uh, TSA does not like this. So if you're an in integrator who travels for a living and, and has to go to different job sites and fly around and things like that, uh, just make it a note to put this into your uh, check bag. TSA uh, will take those away from you and they're not exactly cheap to replace. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at are the fiber strippers. You have to be very, very aware that the, this stripper tool is made specifically for the fiber. Um, so use the stripper tool that comes in the kit. Don't use a traditional uh, wire stripper that you buy at you know, Home Depot or Lowe's or something like that. You, you, can, uh, you can damage the cable. Uh, the, these are designed specifically and calibrated specifically for those, uh, for those jackets and whatnot. Then you have the cleaver. This is probably one of the most important parts right here. This is the piece that you're going to use to actually cut the fiber before you terminate it. Um, these are calibrated very specifically for the clear line fiber, um, at least the clear line kit is, like what we're showing here in the picture. So the, uh, the cleaver here is a very important part as well. You also have what's called the light cannon. Uh, we also call that the visual fault locator, so sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the VFL. This is basically a laser pointer, but on the end, that fits both of the SC and LC ends. So once you make your termination, you can uh, hook up the um, you can hook up the VFL to it, and you can send light through the optical cable. And if you see light on the other end, then you know that there's signal getting through. So that's a very important piece. It also comes with a little adapter. This a little adapter for the VFL. Um, that's for either an LC or an SC end. Um, I believe it fits SC. Uh, yeah, if I remember, yes, it does. It fits SC uh, by default, and that little adapter will let it fit an LC connector. We also have the optical power meter. Uh, that measures signal loss on the other end. 
So, um, you know, if, if we uh, if we're getting pure signal, uh, no big deal. But if something did happen, maybe the termination wasn't so good or maybe something has happened to the cable between point A and point B, the optical power meter will give you an idea of how much signal has been lost from point A to point B. Hopefully none, but you never know. Okay, let's look at some steps on what we do to terminate the fiber. Um, we've got some great videos of this. Uh, Clearline does on their YouTube page. Uh, we have a video that should be published very soon. Uh, we'll redo some hands-on demonstrations. Um, but again, this can be done in less than a minute with some practice. So the first thing that you wanna do is unscrew the boot from the bottom of the connector and slide it down the cable. Next, you're gonna use the strippers to strip off the jacket. It does say down here to strip two inches. Honestly, that's just a general rule of thumb. If you strip it more than two inches, not the end of the world, because um, you're gonna you're gonna cut the fiber to the length that you need anyway for the termination. Um, what a lot of installers and integrators like to do, I'm a big fan of this myself, um, go ahead and put the end on to the VFL and uh, before you even um, terminate it. Uh, there's a hinge right here that you can open up, and there's a little window right here that you can look through uh, to see if there's light or no light to determine if the termination was good. So if you go ahead and hook up the VFL to the to the connector before you do the termination, it it will help you um, it will help you on the other end. So if this is one end of the cable. This is gonna be the other end. So we mentioned before about the plastic protective coating that's over the cladding. Um, that stuff you don't even need the strippers for. This is really cool. You can do this with your fingers. So if you look at the example here, um, you can take that, that plastic uh, protective coating and just kind of pinch it between your four fingernail and, your, and the padding, the, the skin on your thumb. And you can literally just sort of peel it right off of, of, the, of the cladding. Uh, so it's going to give you a nice, um, a nice big chunk here of the fiber. Um, and again, like I said, it, it does mention to, to do the stripping at two inches, but because you're going to be cutting it with the cleaver anyway, it's not the end of the world if you strip back more than two inches. That just means you're going to cut more here. So it's not the end of the world. Um, now, once you peel back the protective layer, you're going to go ahead and insert the cable into the, to, to the cleaver, and we're going to go ahead and cut it. Uh, one thing I do want to make a note here. Um, the way you terminate LC versus SC, um, they're extremely similar. Here's the biggest difference. Um, this, is an, this is set up to terminate an SC connector. So you'll notice there's some markings right here on the cleaver itself. So you want to put the jacket at the recommended mark here for, um, for the end that you're working with. These little markings are millimeters. So if we're going to terminate an SC end, you want to put the jacket right at 28 millimeters. If you're um, if you're terminating LC, you want to put the jacket at 24 millimeters. And then there's a little. If this was zoomed out a little bit more, you'd see that once you have this in place, you kind of shut the cleaver, and there's a, a a mechanism down here. You push in, that cuts the excess fiber, and then you open up the cleaver, and that part of it's done. Then you can go ahead and insert the fiber that you just cut into the terminator, uh, into the into the end here rather. Because the VFL is already hooked up to the end, you're going to see if you do this correctly because you'll see light on the other end. You'll also see no light in this little window if it's done correctly. Once you have the fiber into the end, then you can go ahead and close this hinge. Remember at the very beginning, we slid the boot down the cable. Now you can slide the boot back up and screw it down right here. Once the boot is screwed back to the end, then you can take your Kevlar shears. You can lop off the excess Kevlar and you have a properly terminated fiber cable. Um, there's a handful of steps. It doesn't take long once you get some practice. Uh, my biggest advice for people is to just do like, you know, sit down one day and, and, and do a handful of them and just get yourself good at it. You know, it's just it's just like cat. Uh, it's just like uh, terminating category cable. You know, once you do it a few times, you really get the hang of it, uh, and, and you end up doing it right every single time. Uh, and if you get really good at this, guys, like I mentioned before, I find this even easier than than terminating cat cable myself. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, what's next? Okay. Um, oh, there's just one thing I want to mention too. We talked a lot about the LC versus the SC ends. Um, what's really cool about this is the ends themselves, they are reusable. You can't reuse them you know, in, for infinity. Um, they do have some kind of limitation on how many times you can reuse them, uh, but you can reuse them a handful of times. 
Uh, so just keep that in mind. If you do want to practice this and, and you're worried about wasting ends, uh, don't worry about it too much. It's not that big of a deal. You can you, re, you can reuse the ends sometimes three, four, five, six times before before they're finally unusable anymore. So as you're practicing, just keep that in mind. You don't have to use a brand new end every single time. Okay, let's talk a little bit about some of the products that AV Pro Edge uh, that we offer uh, when it comes to this fiber stuff. So uh, the first thing that I want to show you guys is the very first product that we ever developed for fiber, uh, as far as extenders go at least. This is called the EXO444 kit. Um, this is a typical uh, extender product, but instead of using category cable, we're going to use the fiber. The picture that we looked at before was actually one of these. You're going to plug the fiber straight into it after it's terminated. And then you're going to connect HDMI to your source and to your display, depending on if you're talking about the transmitter or receiver at least. So um, the EXO444 kit, it's full 18 gigs. Um, it is a 4K60, 444. Uh, we do use our proprietary ICT technology just because the SPF in there uh, is 10, 10 gigs. But again, like I mentioned before, you can always replace that if you want to. Uh, this does support all flavors of HDR, including Dolby Vision. Uh, this does have a built-in scaler, uh, so if you need to downscale 4K to 1080p, we see that in a lot of distributed systems where maybe the kitchen TV is still 1080p or the outdoor TV is still 1080p. You can go ahead and scale that signal down to 1080p at the extender. Um, then, you know, later down the line, when the customer does upgrade that 1080p TV to something 4K and they need more bandwidth, uh, you can just turn off the scaling, and then now you're back to 4K and, and all the good stuff. Uh, we also just, we wanted to put an extra tool in here for the integrators and for you guys to be able to set your EDIDs uh, at the extender if you need to. So there is built-in EDID management. Uh, one thing I do like about this that's really helpful in a lot of situations are the built-in test patterns. So let's say you're having a problem, uh, you can't see picture on the screen. So you can hook up the, um, when you have the transmitter in, in line with the, um, with the infrastructure, you can activate a test pattern inside of the transmitter, and then you can look at the display and see if signal is getting through the infrastructure. Uh, if it is, then you know the problem is with the source. So having the test pattern built into the to the extender kit is really helpful for troubleshooting. Um, also, what we're seeing a lot nowadays is uh, uh, people who like to use the built-in apps on their TV, like Netflix and YouTube and Hulu and Amazon and whatnot, um, versus using those apps on a on a Blu-ray player or Chromecast or you know whatever else they might have in the system. Uh, this is actually something that I do in my own home is I like to use the internal apps on the television. So to be able to get audio back to the rack or through a distributed audio system, we did we did uh, add Arc into this product um, and, and we do support Arc in this in this uh, extender kit. Also, uh, CEC commands. Uh, it does have IR in it, uh, built into it as well, so if you wanted to send IR signals from one room to another, also RS-232 signals, uh, that all works well with the EXO kit. Um, with this particular kit and the SPF that's in there now, um, if you go with OM3 fiber, that will get you up to 300 meters of distance, and you know, in, in a lot of cases, that's plenty. Um, if you need to go longer than that, uh, you can use single mode fiber instead of the optical multi-mode fiber. And now you can go two kilometers if you need to. So again, going back to that situation where you're wiring a 25,000 square foot home or a football stadium or, or just some really demanding environment, uh, you can go up to two kilometers with this product. This is the um, this is kind of the latest and greatest when it comes to um, when it comes to fiber uh, and extender products. Uh, this is the AC EXO UNC kit. Um, the big difference between the two is where we use ICT in this product, this is completely, truly 100% uncompressed. Um, it's really easy to tell in the model number. So if you're shopping on our website and, and looking at these things, uh, we try to make it as easy and, and, and easy to point out for you guys as possible. So the, if you look for the UNC in this model number, that represents the uncompressed, whereas the 444 um, is, the, is the ICT. Uh, supported extender. Uh, this is a full 18 gigs, completely uncompressed, uh, just like the other the the other EXO piece. Uh, this is full HDR, including Dolby Vision. Uh, one thing that we did add to this, which I really love, is Ethernet support. So uh, what you'll notice on this product is that on both the transmitter and the receiver, there's two Ethernet ports, which gives us a total of four. Uh, what you can do with this, if you wire one of the four Ethernet ports to an access point or to a router, the other three are now live. So if you wanted to hardwire your Xbox to the network, or maybe you've got an IP phone uh, like I do for work, 
um, you know, maybe you've got a, a laptop or something and, and you want more security versus Wi-Fi and you want to hardwire it, whatever the case is, um, you know, the, the, whatever you plug into that ethernet port is now hardwired to the network. Uh, this is also 300 meters at OM3 and two kilometers if you, if you go with single mode fiber instead of optical multi-mode. Okay. Uh, this is brand new, hot off the press. We're really excited about this and really proud of it. Uh, we've worked together very closely with Clearline to develop this product. Uh, this is bullet train fiber. Um, this is kind of following the the um, the theme of our bullet train HDMI cables. Um, what you can do with this is uh, really for the integrators uh, to save some time. Uh, we talked a lot of we talked a lot before about how easy and, and fast you can terminate the fiber. Um, and if you want to do that on site, and you know that's completely fine. We wanted to offer a solution for you guys to make your lives a little easier. So as you're ordering the bullet train fiber, you can order it already terminated in custom lengths. So this might help you in a very, very big project where you don't want to spend, you know, let's say you're doing a, a, a couple of hundred fiber runs in a very, very large project. Um, you know, yeah, it can take you about a minute or so to terminate each one, but if you want to save some time in the field when you order this stuff, you can have it custom terminated for custom lengths and, and it'll fit your project. It'll come to you, uh, it'll come shipped to you terminated and, and ready to rock and roll. All you have to do is run it. Uh, you can specify the ends that you like, whether they're LC or SC, that just depends on the manufacturer of whatever products you're using. Uh, it comes in a duplex and it comes in OM3. Uh, one thing I just do want to point out, you'll see the fiber comes in different colors. Uh, OM3 is a dead giveaway because it's this aqua kind of color right here. But if you do decide to order custom uh, fiber runs uh, and fiber cables from us, uh, we can certainly do that for you and save you some time in the field. These are our uh, Bullet Train AOC HDMI cables. These things are awesome. Uh, I'm actually considering uh, upgrading all of my HDMI cables in my home to these. Um, these are very interesting, very special cables. Uh, they're a hybrid, if you will. Um, the thing with HDMI is that there's uh, there's a lot of stuff going on underneath the hood, and the important stuff, the audio, the video, everything that we see in here uh, at the end of the day, those signals all travel down what are called TMDS lines inside of the inside of the HDMI cable. So what we did here is we took the important stuff, the TMDS channels, and instead of copper, those are fiber. So all the audio, all the video, all the data, all the important things are traveling down fiber, whereas all of your communication protocols and your DDC and those types of things, that's still traveling over copper. So this is kind of a hybrid cable of sorts. Um, there are four strands of fiber inside of this cable. Um, so I think I mentioned this before, but a lot of video game guys are, are mentioning that their lag times are better. Um, a lot of installers love these cables because they're they're much lighter, much thinner than a traditional cable. They come in various lengths. You'll see short haul and long haul. Um, the long haul cables are going to be for your very long, more demanding runs. The long haul versions of the AOC cables come anywhere from uh, 10 meters available all the way up to about 40 meters. The short haul cables, those are anywhere from half a meter to 15 meters. But in either case, um, everything that we mentioned before about them is still true. One thing that's very interesting about these cables, which I really, really uh, think is very, very cool. Um, let's say that you go ahead and install a 40 meter long haul cable in a project and it's a pre-wire and the drywall goes up and maybe there's no conduit or whatever the case is. Uh, the point being, you know, that cable is in the wall, end of story. It, it's it's going to be in there forever. And 10 years goes by and now you need more than 48 gigs, for example, or whatever the spec is 10 years from now. What's really cool about this, um, this is going to sound crazy. It sounded crazy to me because um, we've never cut HDMI cable ends off because we, we've never really been able to terminate it. But what you can do with these is literally take a pair of cutters and lop off each end. Because there's four strands of fiber in here, now you can terminate the fiber that's in this cable. So now you have four strands of fiber going to that room. So don't worry about installing one of these and running out of bandwidth in the future. You can cut the ends off and terminate your own fiber onto or your own uh, ends onto there as well. Um, because the data is traveling down the TMDS channels, the stuff that we mentioned before about electromagnetic interference and some of those things, uh, that's out the window. You don't have to worry about that anymore. These are great. Like I said, I'm considering upgrading all my cables at home to these myself. 
There are a few other products I do want to mention um, that are fiber related uh, that's available in our library. Um, the termination kits, we, we mentioned those before. I talked a lot about this particular kit. This is actually the kit that I carry with me and I use. Um, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, everything that you need is in the kit to, to get most jobs done. There is a, a different kit that has like a heavier duty, duty cleaver. Let's say you were terminating fiber all the time and, and you wanted a little bit more heavy duty stuff. There is a, um, there is a different kit that you can buy, but like I said, uh, this is what I personally use and it, it does fine for, for most jobs. Um, this is a really cool new product. Uh, this is clear line fiber. Um, it's super, super thin and it's, it's transparent. So what's nice about it is if you're in a home, I'll use my home as a, as an example, my house is solid concrete walls, ceiling, everything. It's very, very difficult for me to run wire in my home. So what I could potentially do is I can take this cable. I can run it around the door jam. I can run it underneath the baseboards. Um, and it's out of sight, out of mind. You never see it. It's super, super thin. In fact, we had to use this stuff at our home office in Sioux Falls, uh, South Dakota, because, you know, the building we purchased for our new office, um, obviously it was already built. So, um, you know, we had to, we had to come up with some clever solutions to get fiber to some of the rooms. And this is the stuff that we used. You never see it. What, what we see a lot of integrators doing right now is, um, let's say for example, you, um, you could run this cable in between drywall and putty over it. So like where the drywall meets up with the floor or the drywall meets up with the ceiling, uh, you can run it because it's so thin uh, in the little gaps and then you can putty over it and it's 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 out of sight, out of mind. You never even have to worry about it. Um, there's fiber cable that we also sell that has uh, more than one strand in it. We talked about some of those before. We carry all of the different ends that you might need for different projects. So feel free to visit our website and uh, you can see everything that we we have to offer for for the for the fiber solutions. And again, I do want to point out because I know there's a lot of commercial guys that are getting in, getting into this right now and have been into it for a while. If you do need that uh, specific riser or plenum rated cable, then uh, we have plenty of that stuff available too. Okay, great. So just a quick uh, quick recap. Um, we talked a lot about copper cables and what some of their limitations are. And, and why we want to get into fiber. Um, there's so many more advantages of using fiber as far as um, uh, technical uh, technical abilities and bandwidth um, allocations and you know, every, everything that we're looking forward to in the future. Fiber is going to really be something that's going to help us uh, get these really huge and beautiful pictures that, that we desire. Uh, it's easily terminated in the field. It's very affordable now. It's safe to terminate. Um, and it really should be something that you should definitely be considering going forward. Um, even if you run fiber in a project right now and you don't use it and you leave it dark, that's okay. It's already there. So in two years, uh, the customer wants to upgrade some stuff. Uh, instead of running new wires and having to deal with that mess, uh, the fiber's already there. You just have to terminate it and, and use it to, uh, to whatever application that you need it for. So thank you so much, guys. That, that concludes the, uh, the presentation. Um, there, uh, there are a couple of phone numbers up on the screen right now. If, if you wish to give us a call to ask us any questions specifically about the fiber. Um, my name is Jason. Like I said before, if my, uh, if you have any specific questions or if you want a copy of the PowerPoint, I'm happy to share. Just shoot me an email at jason at avproglobal.com or just mention it in the question box. If you want a copy of the PowerPoint, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the question box now and I'm going to see if there are any questions that we can address that uh, maybe Tom didn't get to. So um, there's a question from Kenneth. He asks what the difference is between termination kits. Um, which do I recommend? Uh, the kit that I showed you um, retails for about five or six hundred dollars. Um, I mentioned before that the the other kit has uh, a few more pieces in there that allow you to do some uh, more uh, detailed testing and um, and uh, there's a heavier duty cleaver in there. If you are using um, using the fiber and using the cleaver and you're doing it all the time, uh, let's see what else might be in here. Let's see. Does the arc support Atmos? Um, in eARC and oh gosh, there's a couple. Lowry, that's a good question. Uh, I know eARC touches on Atmos a little bit. We're still learning a little bit about eARC because uh, it is new. Um, 
We are seeing it on some HDMI 2.1 products. Uh, that's one thing about the new HDMI 2.1 spec is it does support eARC, but um, eARC will be supported uh, by some HDMI 2.1 products as well. Let me double check on that and get back to you. Um, but I believe it does, it might be, uh, yeah, I don't wanna give any wrong information. So let's look into that and we'll talk offline. Uh, let's see if there's any other questions here. Uh, let's see, let's see. Got a few people that want the slide deck. That sounds great. I'm happy to share that with you. And as I'm scrolling down, that looks like the end of it. So it looks like uh, Tom was able to answer most questions. Thank you so much, Tom, for answering those questions for everybody. Um, if there's any questions that I didn't see right here in the chat box, I'm uh, I'm happy to answer those questions for you. If anything, check the AV Pro Edge um, forums um, today or tomorrow. I will send everybody an email when the Q&A uh, is all done. and um, that way you guys can not only see the answers to your specific questions, but you can see the answers to everybody's questions because you might have some of the same questions. Um, so cool, that looks like that's it guys, for this time at least, thank you so much for joining. And until next time, be safe out there, have fun, and let's make some good pictures and some good sound for our customers. Um, have a great weekend and we'll see you next time.